Hello everybody, Professor Hassey again, week five, video update number two. This concerns our topic for the week, capital budgeting and capital return. How to measure and strategize and perform risk analysis of an investment in an asset, making sure the return is naturally greater than the cost to make that investment. But before we get to that, that analysis and the spreadsheet that I have posted with this, is uh, make sure that, I'll, as you can see in my email to you, I've scheduled uh, a variety of dates and times for you to set up for a WebEx uh, call in the next week. That's Sunday through Friday of next week. Uh, I'd like to spe spend some time again with you, like we did at the beginning of the term, to go over the halfway point of our term, review the work so far, review the work we have yet to do, and answer any questions or concerns that you may have about our course thus far. So please note those times, sign up for them at your availability in your calendar, and then we'll go from there. Capital return and budget capital budgeting is our, uh, is our uh, talk and topic this week. Uh, it's the investment of an asset, and it's a six-step process. Now, again, many of you have studied this, know about it. I'm just adding another layer to this analysis now in our class, Managing Financial Resources, and that is called Risk Analysis. This is from Chapter 11 of your text, Scenario and Sensitivity. There's some good videos in Blackboard. There's some explanations. You need to be familiar with this because our next few cases will concern uh, themselves with these analysis, scenario and sensitivity. The investment in an asset, the determination of the depreciable life, which will be determined, which will determine the life of the investment, the calculation of net income, revenues minus operating expenses, which include depreciation, which include taxes, and then that net income is adjusted by depreciation, working capital requirements, and any disposal of the asset at the end of its life. From that, we do a return analysis. We concentrate on four in this class, net present value, internal rate of return, profitability index, and payback. And that is, fine, uh, that is finalized by the last step, is the numbers of our base analysis worthwhile? Are those numbers that we're projecting in this plan legitimate? Do they work within probability statistics do they appeal to profitability at different levels of input? We're going to take a look at that risk analysis also. So I've put together a, a, a kind of handy little spreadsheet that shows this process. First off, the first tab is a calculation to remind ourselves about the weighted average cost of capital. This is taken from Chapter 9. Weighted average cost of capital is the cost of capital for a particular company at a particular point in time. That cost of capital is determined by the percent of the capital structure, what percent of the company is in is debt, what percent of the company is equity. That, that cost of capital is determined by the after-tax cost of debt in relationship to the interest rate on the debt you pay plus the tax shield you get from that debt. Also, the equity or cost of equity portion of weighted average cost of capital is determined by the risk in the market of your company's risk, the firm's beta, in relationship to market return with average risk and the risk-free interest rate, which is zero risk. Combination of those gives us our cost of equity. Then those amounts are weighted by the capital structure of the company to get the WAC. The WAC is the cost of capital on a company-wide basis based on the parameters in the market and the capital structure of the company at this point in time. You are answering a question concerning this a little bit in your case number two this week. From the WAC, we go to our base analysis. The base analysis is taking that WAC and taking the input values from for the company for this investment this is an investment of $1 million. This $1 million investment is the company's anticipating selling 25,000 units a year for the appreciable life of 10 years at a selling price of $20 a unit, increasing by inflation at 2.5% a year. 
At the same time, they have costs. The variable costs are $8 per unit, inflating at 2% a year. They have fixed costs at $50,000 a year, inflating at 1% a year. As you can see, these calculations are all included right here. Also added is the depreciation. A $1 million asset is depreciated over 10 years, straight line. That's $100,000. Notice the salvage value is given at $50,000. That salvage value is added back in in year 10 as a disposable ending value, taking into account the gain on that disposal, and thus you have to take out the tax from that $50,000. When we take out our 30% tax rate in this problem, we get net income. That's the net accounting income of this project. From that, we adjust the net cash flows that I mentioned just before in my timeline. We add back in depreciation as a non-cash expenditure. We add in the salvage value or disposal value, less the tax on that gain. And then we take into account working capital. Working capital in this problem is 12% of the following year's sales. Working capital is excess cash that you need to have before you get reimbursed from the sale of the product. Working capital, in this case, is 12% of $500,000, thus $60,000 of cash in year zero is additional cash outlay for this project. And then working capital is adjusted every year as sales change. Remember, we have to keep a working capital base of 12%. To keep that base of 12%, we take the delta between the year two and year one, year one take 12% of that, 1,500, and so on. So we're maintaining a 12% working capital base throughout. Then in year 10, when the project is now financially completed, we add back in all that working capital. The net effect is a zero or wash over the life of the asset but we're accounting for cash flow needs for working capital and then that net working capital being reimbursed in the final year. This is all highlighted in chapter 10 of your textbook. From that, you've done this before, we take in a discounted cash flow. Taking this total net cash flow, which in this case is $2.4 million, discount it back at our cost of capital that we just calculated, 8.83%. And there we have it, the discounted cash flow. The difference between discounted cash flow and the net cash flow is our net present value. The internal rate of return is the return over this 10 year life in a percent, 17.03%. The profitability index is the relationship in this case of the discounted cash flow in relationship to the investment. And the payback in years is how long it takes us to straight pay back the investment. One, two, three, four point nine four years of payback. That's our return analysis. You have seen this before in California Best Trucks case, Road King case, and some of you in other classes. That's the return analysis. This is what's different in our class. It's right here, risk analysis. Pages 471 to 474, pages 460 to 470 in your textbook, scenario and sensitivity analysis. What these analyses are is to take the base case and determine what if our sales change. Our base case is 25,000. What if our sales go down to 12,005? What if our sales increase to 35,000 and everything remaining the same? We also give a risk assessment of that, the probability of that occurring. Many of us work in companies where there's what is called risk managers, cost accountants. These individuals and even your public accounting firms determine the risk of certain events occurring at your facility. This risk is measured in the scenario analysis. And if you go to the risk analysis tab, you will see the scenario analysis here the probabilities of these events occurring, and the net present value associated. This is our base case that we calculated here. Here's our weak assessment or weak case here. There it is right there. And here's our strong analysis tab here with that appropriate 
MPV. Then we weight those present values by the likelihood or probability of that event will occur. And then we add up those weighted averages and we get a scenario. What it says for this particular investment, that even though we are predicting a 25% chance of a weak investment, the good thing about that is, is that the overall scheme of things, you weight that by that probability, this investment does seem on the whole fairly positive. The good thing about doing this scenario analysis is that, remember, you have your analysis already set up here. This is your base going out in the future. That's why they call it a budget. Well, as you see projected actual numbers come in and they go below what you anticipated selling, you can see those trends and know what's going to happen based on your weak analysis. If you see sales dropping, you know you're going to start losing money. It gives you a management tool by which you can base your actual numbers to what you originally planned. And finally, the sensitivity analysis. The sensitivity analysis takes the base case, the original case, and then changes certain variables. In this sensitivity analysis, the variables are selling price per unit, which originally starts out at $20, the variable cost per unit at $8 a unit, and the WAC at 8.83. What we do in the sensitivity analysis is try to determine what if each one of these variables changes plus or minus a certain percent. How does that affect the NPV and the profitability of the project if those key variables change? You just change one variable at a time. You don't change them all. So if I put that into account, and you can see this in my risk analysis here, if I change the selling price by unit by dropping it by 15%, I make a lot less money. And so on, here's my original base case with no changes in the variables, 458.32. And I can see the range by which a drop in sales and an increase in sales, and what's the type of profits that will create. Here's variable cost per unit. $8 a unit. If I in decrease my variable cost, naturally I'm going to be making money. But if my variable cost increase, that's how much I start making less money. And the range of top to bottom on that. The weighted average cost of capital, again, is the same. What if my cost of money changes? If it goes down, I make money. If it goes up, I lose money. And this chart shows the degree of sensitivity that these changes in variables are. Notice the steepness of the line curve for selling price per unit. That's why, because it has a greater, greater range of sensitivity. That's the, that's the sensitive variable for this project, naturally. If we change selling prices dramatically, that reduces and has a greater effect on profitability, where changes in variable cost and WAC have a a flatter slope, thus their changes are not as dramatic. Why is this important? Because many companies use this for all the variables of a project and they want to find their sensitivity variables. The more sensitive variables, they have to be management ready to change strategy if they see those key variables changing. So as you can see, capital budgeting can be a little bit hairy. A lot of things going on. But we have, again, talked about this before in other classes. I want you to review and look at this work for this week. There's some great explanations in your Blackboard. This spreadsheet will help you kind of figure that out. You can also see how I did it with the formulas in the cells and so on. Take a look at that. If you're not up to speed on that, this is a good study guide and template. Then going forward in the second half of our course, beginning next week, we'll do a lot of strategic work based on this capital budgeting technique. So that's what we have it to this week for week number five. Pick a calendar date and time to talk to me next week. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about capital budgeting and also add some other characteristics to that strategic analysis of that. And have a great weekend. And this is Mr. Hasse signing off halfway through our course. It's hard to believe it goes by this fast. From Business Finance Central in Claremont, California. So long until next time. Bye-bye.